doing that, if anyone wants to send out a chat, feel free to do so. All right, here we go. Here at the Theodore Roosevelt inaugural site in Buffalo, New York, we're delighted that we've been able to continue our monthly speaker night series thanks to the magic of Zoom. Speaker night is our opportunity on the fourth Tuesday of most months to invite experts to help us think about some of the issues that were important during TR's presidency and continue to be relevant today. We couldn't do this without the generous support of our sponsors, M&T Bank, as well as the New York State Council on the Arts. We also appreciate you, our virtual audience, for being a part of this evening's program. Tonight's talk has a little bit of everything. The title, as you may recall, is Theodore Roosevelt, the Unscrupulous Concessionaire and the Insane Adversary. Uh, really, mo what more could you want? <laughs> Our speaker is Jeremy M. Johnston, uh, who serves as the historian of the Buffalo Bills Center of the West, the Hal and Naoma Tate Endowed Chair of Western History, and the managing editor of the papers of William F. Cody. And I should also uh, shout out to Shirley Hutters, who I see is joining us. Thank you, Shirley, for the introduction to uh, Jeremy. Jeremy attended the University of Wyoming, from which he received his Bachelor of Arts in 1993 and his Master of Arts in 1995. Johnson uh, earned his PhD in American Studies at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow, Scotland in 2017. His doctoral dissertation examined the personal and professional relationship between Theodore Roosevelt and William F. Buffalo Bill Cody. It's soon to be published by the University of Oklahoma Press. Johnson is the recipient of the 2006 Coke Wood Award sponsored by Westerners International for his article, Progressivism Comes to Watt Yellowstone, Theodore Roosevelt and the Professional Land Management Agencies in the Yellowstone Ecosystem. He recently co-edited uh, Beckoning Frontiers, the memoir of a Wyoming entrepreneur with Lynn Howes. This work details how three investors from Buffalo, New York, that those being George Bly Blystein, Henry Jerrins, and Bronson Rumsey, contributed to the establishment of Cody, Wyoming. I suspect we may have to ask Dr. Johnston back to speaker night to tell us the story of Uncle Bronson, as we like to call him, um, and his investor friends. But as I said, he's here to, this evening to talk about Theodore Roosevelt, the unscrupulous concessionaire, and the insane adversary. With that, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Jeremy Johnston. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Lenora. Can you hear me okay? I, all right, I'm gonna, I, we, I can hear you. I'm just gonna assume that uh, okay. I haven't gotten anything in the chat saying that no one, somebody else can't hear you, so I think we're good. Okay, all right, very good. Well, thank you, Lenora. Wait, I just, for, I just saw a hand go up. Uh, I think we're good, yep. Turn it over to okay. you. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to the Theodore Roosevelt inaugural site, one of my favorite institutions dedicated to preserving the memory of Theodore Roosevelt. And I want to also thank Shirley for the, the introduction. Uh, Shirley and I have been friends for quite some time. And uh, in fact, she's the one that kind of got us going on some of the uh, the things with the Beck manuscript that was just finished up, the Beckoning Frontiers publication. And then I don't know if Molly Quackenbush is in the audience or uh, any of the Rumseys, but I also want to give them a shout out as well. So uh, I actually spoke at the Theodore Roosevelt inaugural site a few years ago, and uh, just so happened to be in the middle of winter. And I was able to experience my first lake effect snowstorm. So I want to give everyone in Buffalo my props for surviving those cold winters. Uh, believe it or not, I think uh, we have it a lot easier here in Wyoming. So whenever it gets too bad here in, in the state of Wyoming, I just think of that time uh, trying to get to the airport in the middle of a snowstorm there in Buffalo. Anyway, uh, this evening we're going to talk about President Roosevelt, the unscrupulous concessionaire, and the insane adversary. Uh, this is almost like a, uh, a mystery uh, conspiracy type of story. So I'm going to step our way through here, and uh, I know 
it may be challenging to kind of keep track of all the characters here, but uh, anyway, we'll try to try and hit the high points. And then at the end of the presentation, I'll also give you access uh, to a site where you can order the article itself if you want to follow up on uh, any of the information within the presentation. So Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt's interest in Yellowstone began in the 1880s when he partnered with George Bird Grinnell to found the Boone and Crockett Club. Both Grinnell and Roosevelt were very concerned about what was going on in Yellowstone. Now keep in mind Yellowstone was established in 1872 as the first national park. However, Congress did not really provide any real protection for this area. Uh, the most important thing is it was really missing a effective manager, effective superintendent. These were often political positions uh, that tended to go to people who backed institutions like the Northern Pacific Railroad and who wanted to basically open up the park to their guests and keep other people out. Um, also, the wildlife management in Yellowstone was non-existent. At this point in time, you could hunt in the park, you could fish, catch as many fish as you wanted to. Market hunters started coming into the park and just one case, George, Gr George Grinnell remarked that one family killed between 1,500 and 2,000 elk in one season. So, and imagine that's one of many market hunters there in the park. Uh, you had concessionaires coming in that were claiming hot pools, uh, geyser found formations, setting up some very primitive cabins to, uh, to basically make a buck off of the visitors that were coming in. Now we're really fortunate because when the park was created in 1872, uh, the railroad didn't quite make it yet. The railroad was just basically building across it went belly up in 1873, and it wasn't until the 1880s that the railroad made a connection to the park. So, um, just to point out the person here in the photo, uh, you have Theodore Roosevelt and Major Pitcher here. This is at Mammoth Hot Springs. Uh, things began to change as Roosevelt and Grinnell were getting interested in the park. Uh, the military had taken over the administration of the park, the U.S. Army, taken over administration in 1886, and basically um, provided the first effective police force in the National Park. And Roosevelt did visit Yellowstone twice in the early 1890s. He was there in 1890 with his second wife, Edith, his sister, and then returned in 1891 for a hunting trip outside of the park, let me get it clear, outside the park, but south of the park boundaries there around the Jackson Hole area. Another thing that Roosevelt paid attention to was the need to provide services within the park through controlled monopolies. Uh, I know many of us are familiar with Roosevelt as the trust buster, the one who broke up all these monopolies, but as you're going to see here in Yellowstone, he was really discriminating between the good monopolies and the bad monopolies. And he wanted to make sure the good monopolies could provide that service if he kept the bad monopolies out of the park. So some of the supporting characters, these are the guys that are backing up Roosevelt's policies within the park. Uh, these are the ones protecting Yellowstone, not just from the, the visitors and the poachers, but also from the concessionaires. So we have Major John Pitcher, who I pointed out in the previous slide. He was acting superintendent from 1901 to 1907. General Samuel Baldwin Marks Young, who is pictured here on this slide. Uh, General Young fought in Cuba at the same time Roosevelt was there. He uh, was also married to the good concessionaires, um, I should say brother-in-law to the good concessionaire who ran Yellowstone, Harry Child. 
Harry Child, you see on top of the list here, was president of the Yellowstone Park Company. The Yellowstone Park Company basically controlled the majority of the concessions within the park, the stage lines, the hotels, restaurants, all of that was controlled by Harry Child. And you can see there was a direct connection there between Young and Child as well. And then uh, Thomas Elwood Hofer, who some of you probably remember if you've read any of Roosevelt's hunting accounts, especially the Hunt Near Two Ocean Pass article. He was known as Uncle Billy, and he also worked within Yellowstone National Park. Uh, was really quite an amazing individual. He was really the, the first effective game warden within the park. Uh, he was really trying to restore the bison populations in Yellowstone National Park, which had really been depleted by all of these market hunters that were coming through. So anyway, these are the police officers in the park. So these are the guys who are policing the park. Child is managing the businesses within Yellowstone. And then into Yellowstone comes the corrupt concessionaire. This is Ella Collins Waters. He uh, was a well-connected Republican. It was he was reputed to be good friends with Benjamin Harrison's, President Benjamin Harrison's son. And really he was a self-made man. He was born in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. Um, as a young man, he got kicked out of school over and over again. He fought in the Civil War, claimed that he fought at Petersburg. And then after the Civil War, like uh, many young men, he headed west. He came to Cheyenne, he worked for the railroad for a while. He tried to get involved with a gold mining expedition into the Bighorn Mountains, where in his official biography, he claimed he was shot by Indians, wounded by Indians. We uh, begin to suspect actually it may have been a self-inflicted gunshot <laughs> that he cleaned up in his later publication. But anyway, uh, in Cheyenne, he ran into a little bit of bad luck. A friend ran off with all of his money. And so he was able to go back to Fond du Lac after working to regain enough money. But uh, when he gets back to Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, he inherits a little bit of money and he decides that he's going to invest in ranching in the West. So he returns to the West, goes to Montana, he establishes two hotels, establishes a ranch, but the severe winter of 86, 87, the great blizzard wiped out his ranching investments as it did Roosevelt ranching investments. So Waters then began working for the Yellowstone Park Company, the Yellowstone Park Association that was eventually ran by Child. He managed the hotels in um, Mammoth Hot Springs. And uh, it's noted by uh, Paul Shaleri, one of the uh, historians of Yellowstone National Park that Waters generally behaved in the manner of the worst stereotypes of the sleazy park concessionaire. So what was he doing? Well, he uh, eventually left the association after causing all sorts of problems for them by soaping geysers. So basically, if you take any type of soap and put it in a geothermal pool, it changes the consistency of the water and you get a really violent eruption, which is not good for the, the feature. Uh, he was uh, basically keeping soldiers out of the hotels. He was protecting guests uh, and their indiscretions when they get into fights or get a little inebriated and cause problems with the soldiers. And then um, when he set off on his own, he started a steamboat company which was uh, really something that was needed in the park. You gotta keep in mind in this day and age, a lot of people were traveling by stagecoach, which was very dusty. And so you're traveling on a stagecoach, you're covered in dust, having the opportunity to get off of the stagecoach, enjoy a nice ride across Yellowstone Lake to meet the other stage was welcomed by many people. 
He expanded this operation to include the Yellowstone Lake Boat Company, which also provided fishing boats to any individuals who wanted to fish in the lake. Problem with the, uh, the fishing boats is when he quote you a price and you got out into the middle of the lake and you were done fishing, you realized that you had just bought a one-way ticket to the middle of the lake. You had to pay another fee to get back to the shoreline or you uh, just basically sat out there and waited until uh, either Waters or one of his uh, employees got tired of waiting. Uh, other things as well. Waters was often bringing in employees that he would basically keep captive. He promised that if they didn't like the job, he would send them back. Uh, he rarely did that. He usually just kept them until the military became involved and ordered him to get these people back to their homes. And then uh, another feature that he created that we'll talk a little bit more about towards the end of the presentation here, he actually created a zoo in Yellowstone. There's a small island in the middle of Yellowstone Lake called Dot Island, and water set up pens where he kept a group of buffalo, some bison. He also included some elk in there, some antelope, and basically, it's hard to imagine today, but people would get on the steamboat, go out to the island, they would see these wild animals, which they could see for free, uh, traveling through the park more than likely. But anyway, this zoo really became quite an eyesore. Um, Waters was not very good about caring for these animals, as we'll see. All right, this guy has interested me for quite some time. When I was doing my research on my master's degree on Roosevelt in Yellowstone, I came across a book called Roosevelt's Adversary. So this is the insane adversary. And basically the book Roosevelt's Adversary is this guy's memoir and attack of the Roosevelt administration. And I remember at the time when I was writing my master's thesis, I thought, this is really kind of interesting, but a lot of people told me, ignore this kook. He's, uh, he's not that interesting. He's just crazy. Um, he really didn't have an impact on Yellowstone or Roosevelt's management of Yellowstone National Park. But um, I picked this up a few years ago again and started doing some digging thanks to the online newspaper databases that are readily available. And I was really surprised to see how much trouble this guy created for Roosevelt. So anyway, James Fullerton was born in England. His family was fairly wealthy. Uh, as a young man, he got into all sorts of trouble poaching on various estates there throughout England. He immigrated to Canada, where he joined the Northwest Mounted Police, got into problems with them, decided that uh, he was going to leave the Mounties. He homesteaded in Mantaba, Mant uh, Manitoba, and then um, fell out there, went to Texas, from Texas to Arkansas, from Arkansas to Minnesota, to Laramie, Wyoming, and then homesteaded near Tinsleep, Wyoming. This memoir written by James Fullerton is basically the complete opposite of the classic pioneer story. This is really a story of failure. Every time this guy moved somewhere else, he got into a conflict with somebody and he had to pick up and move and go away. Or when they had a nice place set up, his wife would become sick or he would become sick. In one case, he lost sight in his eye, which uh, wouldn't let him farm anymore. So anyway, basically they moved from one spot to the other and never really could quite make it. But eventually he settled near what is called Bear Creek, Montana. Bear Creek is a coal mining town just outside of Red Lodge, Montana. And he and his family, his growing family, started growing vegetables and were making quite a living for themselves selling vegetables to Red Lodge. Uh, he was well respected by the local colleges, uh, agricultural specialists, uh, really did an amazing job. 
growing these vegetables out in the middle of nowhere. And if you've ever been to Bear Creek, Montana, it is the last place in the world you would ever imagine to create a farm. But anyway, he was able to make this. And then he messes up again. It's at this point in time, he, he goes on this trip. Um, the reason for this trip is somewhat questionable. We really don't know exactly what he was doing. But on his return back to Montana, this was in 1902, his return back to Montana, he starts giving these interviews to all sorts of major newspapers. And basically he starts accusing the military administration at Yellowstone of running a poaching ring. The soldiers were supposedly letting poachers just go in and kill off all the wildlife. He made claims that illegal saloons were set up and that Harry Child was basically running all these saloons all over the, uh, all over the park that was creating all sorts of problems for the visitors. Now, according to the interview, Fullerton said he visited Roosevelt in the White House. There's no evidence whatsoever indicating that he ever made it to the White House or he sat down and talked to Roosevelt about any of this. He's just making these wild accusations, nothing really to back them up. Roosevelt contacts Elwood Hofer and he gets Elwood Hofer to go in and talk to this guy just to see where these stories are coming from. You gotta keep in mind, Pitcher and Roosevelt were very good friends, so right away Roosevelt is very suspicious. Hofer meets with Fullerton and basically says the following. While Fullerton was not dishonest, he was overzealous and a bit of a crank on the subject of game. And Hofer also noted that a lot of the accusations Fullerton was making were accusations that were being made by Waters, who by this point in time not only had a falling out with the Park Administration, but basically every concessionaire within Yellowstone who was offering a decent business to the visitors. So 1903 is the date that Roosevelt takes his uh, tour across the United States. Uh, part of the tour was to include a stop in Yellowstone National Park. Now, uh, originally, Roosevelt was wanting to turn this into a little bit of a hunting trip. At the time, they were trying to thin out the mountain lion population so the elk numbers would increase. And he thought, you know, maybe I can get a hunt in. And then his advisor said, no, you can't do that. If you shot anything in the park, it's going to be splashed all over the front page of the newspaper and create all sorts of problems for you. So he gave up the hunting trip in Yellowstone, he gave up the opportunity to kill some mountain lions, and brought John Burroughs instead. John Burroughs was a famed naturalist writer, and he thought this would dispel any ideas or notions that he was going to do some hunting near the park. Burroughs uh, noted in one case when Roosevelt jumped off a sled, you can see the sled photographed here, he caught a mouse, and he took the mouse and he Send it out that night and he sent the pelt down to Clinton Hart Merriam to see if it was a new species of mice. But Burroughs was just panicked because he thought some newspaper reporter is going to mess this up and have Roosevelt catching a moose in Yellowstone National Park instead of a mouse. Fortunately, that never happened. But also at the time, Roosevelt, I really believe, was motivated to investigate the park just to follow up on Fullerton's accusations. See what's really going on in the park with the concessionaires, with the wildlife, the visitors. And it's likely at this time that he learns more about waters and all the problems he's creating in Yellowstone National Park. Now this is where it gets interesting because if you look at the sled there, you'll notice the man in the back sitting next to Burroughs with the heavy coat and the mustache, that's Harry Childs. So Roosevelt spent a lot of time with the guy who managed the monopoly 
in Yellowstone National Park for the stagecoaches, the hotels, and most of the restaurants. So right there, you have the Trust Buster with one of the biggest monopolists in that area. But I believe at this time that Roosevelt really kind of saw monopolies as a necessary evil. And um, if you look at his campaigns later on, 1912, when, when um, Wilson and him were getting into the issue of monopolies, you know, basically Roosevelt made it clear that the monopoly is good, the government will basically allow it to continue, just make sure it doesn't get into any nefarious problems. If it's a bad monopoly, it'll be broken up, it'll be destroyed. So at this time, Roosevelt also uses the bully pulpit to basically proclaim that everything is well in Yellowstone National Park. He basically says that this gives this area gives people the opportunity to see wildlife like it was in the good old days before the railroads came, before all the settlers came in and slaughtered the elk, the bison, the deer, and so on. So it was basically full of animals. He noted frequently that he was just surprised, not only on the amount of wildlife, but how tame they were. He had noted that back in the 1890s when he was there that you would rarely see wildlife approach anyone, but now the wildlife was so accustomed to the visitors that they would come right up to people. In fact, um, it's at this time that you also have the feeding of the bears in the hotel dumping grounds, which created all sorts of future problems for the administration of the park. And uh, after this visit, or sorry, let me jump back a little bit. Another thing Roosevelt made it clear is that the military was doing a good job managing these parks. The military was doing a good job managing Yellowstone. And he said as follows, the essential feature in the present management of the Yellowstone Park is its essential democracy. It is the preservation of the scenery, of the forests, of the wilderness life, and the wilderness game for the people as a whole. Instead of leaving the enjoyment thereof to be confined to the very rich who can control private reserves. And he basically said this is what the military was ensuring was occurring there in Yellowstone National Park. Fullerton, on the other hand, does not shut up. Fullerton continues to reach out to the newspapers and his accusations against Major Pitcher and the park administration and Harry Child's control over the park go all over the place. Uh, he's once again brings up the saloons. In some cases, he said there was uh, renegade bears that were allowed to run loose that were chasing tourists because these tourists were actually staying at other concessions. And so uh, you imagine, yeah, we have the military basically allowing the bears to control visitors that are staying at child, uh, staying outside of child's concessions. But um, Fullerton's time was numbered. Although he created all sorts of publicity about supposed issues in the park, in 1905, the Red Lodge newspaper reported that Fullerton had been arrested for trying to kill his son-in-law with a pitchfork. That led to a insanity trial when uh, Fullerton was brought in and basically was judged to be insane. And it's during this insanity trial that Fullerton basically says, yeah, I made it all up. Um, I made up the, the accusations, this isn't really going on. And then it's interesting because he says at the end there that basically he was encouraged to do this. Somebody was pushing him, someone was providing the money to keep him before the press. And uh, we probably, you know, we don't have any definite proof, but I would say more than likely it was E.C. Waters who was funding Fullerton's effort at this point in time, trying to protect what he was doing in the Yellowstone National Park. So, Roosevelt decides Waters needs to go. 
So Fullerton's been taken care of with the insanity trial, but now Waters needs to be removed from Yellowstone National Park. Major picture zeroes in on E.C. Waters' new steamboat. He had two steamboats. He had the, the Zilla, which you see photographed in the photograph there on the, uh, the left-hand side of the screen, and then the E.C. Waters, which you see um, in its poor condition there after it had been beached on Stevenson Island. Anyway, Waters puts in a permit to go from one steamboat to two concessions, and this needed to be approved by the military, by the superintendent, John Pitcher. Well, Pitcher decides this is not safe. He said, no, the EC Waters, this nice big boat you just bought, is not deemed seaworthy. Actually, the ship did pass safety inspection. It was licensed and could have gone anywhere on the lake and been just as safe as the original steamboat. However, Pitcher says, you know, nope, no permit. So Waters, in one of his fits, beaches the steamboat, you see on the right there, on Stevenson Island in the middle of Yellowstone Lake. The steamboat set out there uh, as time went on, uh, basically it became an eyesore, as you see, and it uh, became a spot for a lot of people to go out there in the middle of winter and have parties and have all sorts of fun out there. And finally, the park administrators, this is back when the park service was now in charge, decided to basically burn it down to the water line. If you do take a tour of Yellowstone National Park, you can still see the remnants of this. You can see the, the keel of the boat, it's a low water mark there, and you can see the propeller sticking up above the water line as well. If you want to, uh, it's kind of fun, you can go into uh, Google Maps and zero in on Stevenson Island, and you'll see this, this steamboat, the ruins there. So the steamboat concession basically was limited. Uh, Waters starts bringing out the political pressure, trying to strike back at Pitcher. Pitcher, basically unlike previous military superintendents, realizes he has the backing of Roosevelt. Roosevelt made it clear to Pitcher, get Waters out of there. Do whatever you have to do, but get him out of there. He's not welcome. The next superintendent, so when Young took over in 1907, the battle against Pitcher continues. I'm sorry, the battle against Waters continues. But at this point in time, the focus was on the zoo. So this is a stereograph of the Dot Island Zoo. That's on Dot Island in the middle of the lake. So you can see a bull elk, a cow elk, and a bison. When Waters lost the steamboat license for the E.C. Waters steamboat, basically he decided he would become a problem with the zoo. He decided to stop getting hay for these animals, these wild animals, uh, because uh, what, Pitcher and then uh, basically Young did the same thing, started limiting the areas he could graze livestock in the park. So Waters basically said, well, if I can't feed them any grass from the park, I'm going to feed them garbage. He literally would take the trash from the boat, um, trash like mills, any type of garbage, and that became the food for these wild animals. Uh, one case, a group of game wardens came through and they stopped and they watched this zoo. They looked at it. And one game warden reported it was the only time in his life that he had ever seen an elk eat meat. It was basically a piece of rotten, spoiled meat that they had thrown out with the garbage. And this elk was desperate enough that it was trying to eat this spoiled meat. The other thing that Waters did is in the winter, he would bring the animals back to shore, but he made sure his pins on shore were right next to Harry Child's Lake Hotel. So as you can imagine, that piles up the manure and everything, the filth, the waste, and Waters refused to clean the pens. 
So if you were staying in Lake Hotel, you would often get the, uh, the scent of Waters' wild animal pens that he got you on know, the winter pens that he kept next to the hotel. Young realized he also has the backing of Roosevelt, and they realized Waters' lease was going to expire soon, and they decided to wait him out. When the lease came up for renewal, basically the lease was canceled. Waters was evicted from the park. He had to leave everything behind, the steamboats, his uh, Yellowstone Lake Boat Company, which was a really an impressive stone structure within the park. That was all left behind. This is where it really gets interesting if you want to make all sorts of conspiracy theories. Guess who got the boat concession? It went to Elwood Hofer. He ran it for a while as the Yellowstone Lake Boat Company. And then it was passed on to Harry Child. Waters was incensed. Waters basically kept playing his political connections, trying to get to Roosevelt, trying to get Roosevelt to reverse his decision. And basically he failed. Well, believe it or not, after Roosevelt leaves office and Taft becomes the President of the United States, Waters is able to reach the Secretary of the Interior, Richard Ballinger, and they renew his lease. Fortunately, by this point in time, Waters' life had fallen apart. His wife was sick, his daughter committed suicide all of which Waters blamed on Harry Child, Pitcher, Young, and Roosevelt. But anyway, Waters basically sat back and let it go. He was reimbursed for the loss of uh, the improvements he had put in the park, the concession, when it was transferred over to Childs and to, and to uh, Hofer. Now our friend, James Fullerton, he makes a, a reappearance. So in 1912, which as all of you know, is the year that uh, we have the Bull Moose campaign. We have Roosevelt running against Taft. We have him running against Woodrow Wilson. Well, at that point in time, this book comes out in print. Autobiography of Roosevelt's Adversary by James Fullerton. So now, after Red Lodge, Fullerton had moved to Port Townsend, Washington, where he started growing vegetables again, started growing fruit. In fact, um, he became known as Loganberry Jim because he was so big into promoting Loganberries there in Washington. Within this book, the whole encounter with Roosevelt takes a vicious and uh, very different spin than those earlier attacks. According to Fullerton, not only did he, in the book, in his autobiography, not only did he meet with Roosevelt in the White House, but when he told Roosevelt about everything the pitcher was doing wrong, Roosevelt threatened to basically handle Fullerton like they handled the rustlers in Johnson County. He basically said if he said anything negative about Pitcher, this guy was going to have the Secret Service show up and he was going to disappear. So Fullerton said he, he basically kind of backed off, went into hiding, and then he makes the accusation that Roosevelt wouldn't have let it go and Roosevelt arranged for Fullerton to be convicted of insanity and sent to the asylum. So now Fullerton does get out of the insane asylum. According to this book, however, he uses his Masonic connections to break out of the insane asylum, and then he secrets himself off to Canada where he hides out and then eventually moves down to Port Townsend. He also, in the autobiography, claimed that while he was traveling, he ran into a group of soldiers at Fort Washakie here in Wyoming, and uh, I quote, they laughed at the idea of Roosevelt leading up San Juan Hill, saying he was not with them, but in his tent sending dispatches. So Fullerton pulls out all the stops. We gotta kinda ask ourselves, well, who could be behind this publication? 
And this is from the dedication there. Basically, he said a large number of friends requested he write this book. And I personally believe, again, there's no evidence to back this up, hard evidence, but I really begin, I really believe this is Waters' last attempt to strike back at Roosevelt for pushing him out of Yellowstone National Park. So the legacy of all this, uh, first of all, I just wanna say that I really think Roosevelt's handling of this situation reveals a lot about his political leadership. Both Fullerton and Waters greatly deserved to be beaten by the big stick and to ride it on the bully pulpit. Yet TR did not attack them directly. He did not publicly berate or belittle Fullerton or Waters misleading and false statements. Instead, he went directly to those political issues that these men had raised, requested those under his administration to verify the true situation and report back to him. Roosevelt then took the issue before the people without publicly discrediting his opponents by attacking their personalities. Now today, visitors to Yellowstone National Park pass through Roosevelt Arch, which you can see pictured here. This was designed by Harry Charles, Child's architect, Robert Reamer. It welcomes visitors through the north entrance. You can also travel down to Roosevelt Lodge and spend a night in a cabin there. So Roosevelt's presence in the park is pretty well established. People know he has a strong connection to the park. What is not as well known is the legacy of Waters and Fullerton. So today, an acre of the Steamboat EC Waters, which lies on ruin on the beach of Stevenson Island, is on display at Bridge Bay Arena off of Yellowstone Lake, reminding visitors about the idyllic images of steamboats escorting Victorian tourists across Yellowstone Lake. Most visitors today do not see the ruins of the animal pens on Dot Island, established by Waters. The Yellowstone heritage of Waters instead lies ruined and broken apart. And thankfully, James Fullerton's autobiography remains out of print, and Roosevelt's influence over Yellowstone eclipsed Fullerton's misguided crusade to evict Major Pitcher. The resulting outcome of this struggle between Roosevelt Waters and Fullerton regarding the proper administration of Yellowstone redefined the phrase for the benefit and enjoyment of the people, which comes from the National Park Act, the act that created Yellowstone, and you can see that is emblazoned on Roosevelt's arch. In his efforts to remove waters from Yellowstone, Roosevelt supported the military administration, removed political pressures that allowed, Rose, allowed waters to misuse his lease primarily for the benefit of himself. Not only did the president's intervention secure Waters' removal from the park, it again raised the questions regarding the professional standards guiding both administrators and concessions, shaping the National Park Service later efforts to control capitalism within Yellowstone through regulated monopolies. Roosevelt's intervention, intervention also promulgated and publicized the outstanding opportunity for visitors to view wildlife within the park in a natural setting instead of zoo-like displays ran by corrupt concessionaires. Roosevelt's defeat of Waters and Fullerton stopped the possibility of Yellowstone benefiting only a few at the expense of the greater good of the many. So that ends the presentation. Um, if you are interested in the article, this was published by Yellowstone History Journal in 2019. This is published by the Museum of the Yellowstone outside of West Yellowstone, Montana. The link to, uh, to get to this journal is there uh, where you can purchase it. I'm gonna warn you, it is a little pricey. It's uh, $16 plus shipping and handling, but there are a wonderful uh, collection of illustrations throughout the, the journal illustrating various aspects of Yellowstone's past. So and with that, I would be happy to take any questions or comments. Kind of nice being on a monitor far, far away. I'm not uh, getting any fruit thrown at me. I'm sure there wouldn't be any fruit, Jeremy. Um, that, that was uh, quite the story, quite the, uh, 
quite the uh, convoluted story and uh, whatnot. I don't know if anybody has any questions that they want to add to the Q and A. That would be great. I was wondering though. Um, again, you mentioned the uh, Fullerton's autobiography and its publication in 1912. I, I was just wondering, did it get did that biograph autobiography get any traction? Did it um, you know, in that election cycle? No, no, I did find a few newspaper articles where they reviewed Fullerton's uh, autobiography, but it really did not make even a ripple during the election. Hmm. Uh, I saw no indication whatsoever that Wilson or Taft or anybody even referred to this. And if you really want to punish yourself, you really ought to just go, you can go online and get a copy of Roosevelt's Adversary. And I think they're also doing uh, reprints now through Google Books and so on. But I, it is just such a crazy story. It is so mm -hmm. outrageous and so over the top. Um, I, I really don't know who Fullerton was relying on to edit the book, but I mean, he just basically trashed anything connected with Roosevelt and it was you know, even the charge up San Juan Hill was uh, discredited by Fullerton. It was just so crazy. No one really took it serious. Hmm. Interesting. Um, when did the Park Service take over Yellowstone? So, yeah, the Park Service took over in 1916. And one thing I failed to mention, but um, Young, General Young, when he took over the park, one of the lasting legacies of Yellowstone, or lasting legacies of Roosevelt in Yellowstone, was he challenged Young to come up with a civilian park guard. He realized that the military did an effective job policing the park, but they were horrible in handling visitors, especially the interpretation. In fact, there's a great story I love to tell where a group of soldiers decided one day that they would fix up Old Faithful Geyser. Uh -oh. They found this old steam valve and they put it under the ground there, the pipe under the ground. So just the wheel, the pressure wheel, was up on the surface there and they watched their, their clocks and as soon as Old Faithful was about ready to go off, they'd run out there and they'd turn this big wheel, supposedly opening the pressure valve and Old Faithful would go off. And as it went down, they would close it and everyone's all disappointed because it's just basically, it's not a natural geyser, it's a feature of the park or the military is operating. So that's kind of the issue there. Um, Roosevelt challenged Young to come up with a civilian park guard, and Young generated a report, which uh, you can see if you go into the Roosevelt papers at the Library of Congress, and really he kind of outlined exactly what the Park Service did when it was created in 1916 in managing Yellowstone. So for Roosevelt, however, he doesn't get credit for the Park Service, that goes to Wilson because Congress was not about to create a civilian park guard for Roosevelt. And the last thing they wanted was another agency under Roosevelt's control. So Roosevelt actually for a while played around with the idea of transferring the national parks over to the National Forest Service. The National Forest Service would then manage places like Yellowstone. That didn't occur either. You know, by that point in time, Roosevelt's relationship with Congress was just too strained to where you could really do what he had done in the earlier years of his administration. Hmm. All right, thank you for that. Um, and thank you to Diane for uh, asking that question. Stacy wanted to know, um, were Waters' actions, that is his business practices, actually illegal or just immoral? Oh, it was really, most of it was immoral. Um, some of it was borderline illegal. Um, Yellowstone has always had a, a very strange history when it comes to judicial enforcement of policies. Um, Yellowstone actually did not have a court in place until later. Um, so a lot of what was going on you know, basically, if you wanted to prosecute someone for violating a policy, 
you would have to take him down to the nearest court in Wyoming, which was Evanston, Wyoming. So if you imagine the state of Wyoming, it's a big square. Yellowstone is up here in the northwest corner. Evanston is down here in the opposite corner of the state there. So you'd have to take them all the way down there for any type of prosecution. When they did get a judge, they were able to enforce some fines, um, able to punish people like the poachers and everything. But, but Waters, you know, was always one step ahead of them. He used his political connections to really avoid being prosecuted by the park administration. And again, a lot of those earlier military superintendents before Roosevelt took over just assumed, if I do anything against this guy, I'm gonna basically be removed from office because he has those political connections to the Republican party. So, but you know, some of the other things he did that were legal, there was all sorts of accusations that were never proven that was actually running an illegal trap line in the park. He was paying somebody to trap all sorts of fur bearing animals and was selling the hides on the black market there. Um, but you know, most of the nuisance though was just poor treatment of visitors, really poor treatment of visitors. And even his staff, his staff. There were a number of women that made accusations that he would take them on a ride in his wagon and then there'd be problems with the wagon before they got home and they would be stranded there for the night. And he started uh, basically, you know, putting the advances on them and they basically had nowhere to really go to to turn. And uh, again, with the military being with their hands tied, they were unable to really push that. So, so yeah, no, not a, not a nice guy. If you go to Yellowstone National Park, the, the complaint file on Waters is unreal. Uh, it is just an ongoing saga of one bad thing after another of him uh, going after visitors, staff, the military. Not a good guy. Wow. They still have all those records of the uh, complaints? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, being a uh, military, or I should say being military oh, and yeah. a federal agency, the National Park has a tremendous archive in Gardner, Montana. It's actually right before you get into the Roosevelt Arch, you'll see their facility. And it's one of the few national parks that actually has its archival record on site. So it's really quite amazing what oh. they have in those collections. A lot of, a lot of great stuff. Wow. You might have mentioned this, but when did uh, they decide to burn that uh, boat to the, to the water line? I was, I, that was kind of an um, interesting story there. I want to check out Google Maps. Yeah, um, I, I want to say 1940s. So sometime, I mean, it was okay. quite a while after, after Waters had left. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it was really quite an eyesore. You know, it had slipped from the mooring and it had beached on the island there after Waters had parked it there um, on the dock, but it slipped and landed up on the beach and just basically rotted away. And then a lot of the employees at Yellowstone Hotel would go out there and they would take uh, their rowboats or whatever, they'd go out to the island and they would party on the boat and were setting all sorts of fires there, to bonfires and creating a nuisance. And finally, the park administrator said enough is enough and they just set it on fire and let it go. Trying to imagine all the paperwork they'd have to fill out to do that sort of thing today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Back in that day, they didn't have to worry about that as much. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, and it was really an impressive boat. They said it could handle up to the the east or the villa. The first steamboat could handle about forty people. The EC Waters that said you could handle about two hundred passengers on that. Oh wow! And it only sailed with visitors one time and that was probably on its initial run after it had passed a safety inspection but then pitcher said no it's not safe pulled the permit for that boat and that was basically the first time waters ever really faced any kind of uh, repercussions for anything he had done in yellowstone hmm. wow 
Wow. Wow. Fascinating. Um, I know Yellowstone, I, I've been to Yellowstone a couple times and it's just so amazing. And I'm sure I mean, everyone who I'm sure who's been there feels the same way. Um, I don't see any other questions. Uh, if anybody does have any, either you know, raise your hand or type them into Q&A. Um, give folks a couple minutes, but uh, we certainly appreciate the uh, ins and outs of this complicated story. What was it like researching all of this? I, you know, what was, what were the sources? Well, you know, the, the first source was Roosevelt's adversary, that publication. I had consulted that years ago and just kind of dismissed it as, as uh, crazy guys ramblings and didn't think there was much of a story behind the book itself. But, but really, um, when I started digging into these newspaper databases, and found out more about Fullerton, it just really kind of amazed me how much uh, publicity this guy was generating. And again, I think what has also kind of kept Fullerton under wraps was Roosevelt never really came out and directly attacked him, never really berated him publicly. You know, um, so everyone just kind of assumed that Roosevelt ignored him, and that's not really the case. I mean, Roosevelt was, he checked in the issues, he found these were all exaggerations, and then um, we started making connections to Waters through Fullerton. He basically said, you know, it's, it's Waters that's really pushing behind, pushing this guy. And then more than likely, he probably felt bad for this guy. Um, the other thing that's interesting, if you go to find a grave, there's a pretty good history of Fullerton that one of his uh, descendants put together. And you read through that, and apparently this whole connection to Yellowstone National Park attacking Roosevelt is completely forgotten by the family. There, I didn't see at the time when I checked it out, there was no reference whatsoever him taking on Roosevelt. So I don't know if it was mm -hmm. something they were embarrassed about, never spoke about, or didn't publish. But um, yeah, nothing really said about him in this whole controversy in Yellowstone. Wow. Um, all right, while we were, while you were chat, uh, talking, another question came in. Diane is wondering, uh, do you know, are there still a lot of concessionaires in Yellowstone? Yes, yeah, so basically there's five concessions in Yellowstone. Zantera runs the, the hotels, uh, the restaurants in the park, there's some, some shops, the old Hamilton shops are now um, a concession. And I think Zantera also keeps those as well. And then um, the Yellowstone Association runs some bookstores through there, uh, ice cream shops, things like that. So, but in order to do business in Yellowstone today, you need a concession license and you are up for review. So if there's anything that's even questionable about your management of those concessions, you know, basically the, the lease is pulled and it's given to uh, another concessionaire. And that was really kind of, it was necessary because in the early years when you have all these people coming in trying to establish concessions, I mean, they were claiming everything. Uh, they were building these really primitive hotels all over the place. Uh, in some cases, they were even charging people to see geysers and hot springs. Um, you have people running baths in some of the, uh, the hot springs there, the cooler ones, not the real hot ones. So don't go hot potting in Yellowstone. So um, it's, it's not good to take a bath in 200 degree water. But anyway, um, yeah, it was really kind of a necessary evil because they said, you know, we can have all these people come in and just basically trash up the place with their businesses, or we can select a few good quality concessions, run it as a monopoly, and that way we're servicing the, the visitors, people are making a profit, but yet we're not trashing the park. Huh. Let's see. Uh, just looking in our chat. Really appreciate Dr. Johnson's conclusion, his explanation of TR's role regarding the minimal number of concessions and lack of caged animals in Yellowstone, even down to today. 
So um, excellent. Thank you so much. And yeah, and I see that from Stacy. I just want to say hi to Stacy and a really admirer of his work or their, their her work. So yep, Stacy's a good Stacy's another good friend of the TR site. Um, yes. <laughs> we, you know, all the friends we can get. So um, <laughs> I don't see any other questions. Uh, I really, really appreciate you taking some time out of your day to uh, join us uh, all the way from Wyoming on this Zoom and to tell us about this crazy story. Um, like I said, we're, we'll probably, I'll probably be in touch because those three Buffalonians and the, their uh, involvement in the founding of, uh, what was it? it, was Cody or Wyoming, I think you said? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. That might be another story. And I, I, actually we have some, uh, Blystein, I think, got into it with um, Ansley Wilcox as well. I don't know if you've run into that, but we'll have to mm. invite you back. Um, yeah. Well, no, and um, all those great, wonderful posters you see at Buffalo Bills Wild West, a lot of those were printed in Buffalo by the Courier Company. Yep, and I think that's where uh, Ansley gets involved on, in a copyright case that goes up to the Supreme Court, I think. So. Mm. Um, all right, I do wanna again, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you to our um, virtual audience. I will also shameless plug that uh, next month's uh, speaker night will also be online, will be uh, Tuesday, August 25th. And uh, our presenter is Rick Falkowski, who is the author of Profiles Volume One, Historic and Influential People from Buffalo and Western New York. And he'll be talking about uh, Buffalo's 19th century influencers. So um, we might hear about Bronson and a couple others, but uh, uh, keep that in mind. Our uh, folks who are on our email list can uh, watch their email for the uh, more information on that. And again, thank you so much, Jeremy. I'm gonna thank you. end the recording and uh, 